Hi everyone, uh, welcome to ELI, the place where you get your daily dose of inspiration for entrepreneurship. And today we have with us uh, Mr. Sukhendra Reddy, uh, Roma Palli, founder of uh, Sejuva, uh, a platform that facilitates uh, skill-based online volunteering opportunities. Sukhendra has uh, attended IIT Dhanbad for uh, bachelors. Uh, Sukhendra had worked with companies such as uh, Game Sofa and Shortlist uh, before starting his own venture, Sejuba, uh, in 2017. Uh, Sukhendra was uh, featured in Forbes 30 Under 30 uh, in uh, 2020 and is one of the evolving social entrepreneurs of India. Hi, Sukhendra. Welcome to ELI. Hi, hi. Uh, how are you today? Uh, doing great. Thank you. Uh, Sukhendra would like uh, to hear from you about uh, what is uh, Sejuba and uh, before that, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, please? Uh, sure. Uh, well, like most uh, young people who are watching this show right now, um, I have also dreamt of uh, going to the IIT, being an engineer. Uh, did that and after the first year of university, uh, I got an opportunity to volunteer in Malaysia. That's where I first uh, ventured out into this idea of helping people, you know, using your skills. I came back to India. I decided to start uh, an ISEC chapter in my university. Uh, so at our peak, we were a 52 member team facilitating more than 100 people to volunteer every year. Uh, people from uh, India to go abroad and volunteer and likewise people from other parts of the world to come to India and volunteer. So I really found my passion there. Uh, third year into university, I had failed in a subject. So I had uh, one year of a gap. Um, so I used that gap year to um, try out entrepreneurship. So I moved to Russia. I worked for a startup. Um, unfortunately, the startup didn't venture off quite well. So I uh, came back, uh, finished uh, the university, and then moved to Taiwan. I was working for a gaming company. A couple of years down the line, I moved back to India to work for an American tech startup. And that was the time when I was backpacking in Myanmar. And you know, I pinned down the idea of Chizuba. So Chesuba, in fact, means thank you. It means uh, thank you in Burmese. That's where I was when I first laid down the idea. Um, ordered a cake, got the bill, paid, uh, paid the money, and the guy said Chesuba. Just asked him what it means. It means thank you. And I checked out the domain was available. The name was catchy. More importantly, uh, the meaning is very relevant to what we do. So that's how Chesuba started. Hmm. So uh, now tell us, uh, uh, Sukhendra, what is Sejuba all about? Or how it provides, uh, how it brings value to our society? Yeah, so uh, Chesuba is an online volunteering platform. So it's a marketplace similar to Airbnb or Uber or Amazon, where uh, there are two sets of users. So on one side, there are nonprofit organizations or NGOs. So currently, we work with about 4,200 NGOs, which are on board. Uh, they come from 62 different countries. Uh, so they post their requirements as online volunteering projects. So for example, uh, an NGO can say, I need some changes to be done on my website. I need this document to be translated from Hindi to English. I need, uh, let's say my logo to be revamped. So anything and everything which can be done online, the nonprofit can post it as a volunteering project and skill professionals from different parts of the world uh, based on their skills and based on the areas that they wish to contribute to they will uh, take up these online volunteering projects and complete online. So internet leverages, uh, people are leveraging uh, internet to create impact. So as of today, we have more than 82,000 uh, skilled professionals from more than 100 countries who have uh, signed up to volunteer. Uh, on parallel, we also work with uh, companies, multinational corporations, uh, where uh, employees of these companies volunteer and the HR has a dashboard access to see how many of their employees have volunteered, what kind of uh, projects have they picked up, uh, what is the impact that's been created, how many volunteering hours have been clogged, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there are three customers, basically, individuals who want to create impact, corporates uh, which want to uh, make sure their employees uh, create impact, and uh, nonprofits which are seeking for skills. Okay. So uh, here is my question. Uh, uh, when somebody volunteers, uh, I'm assuming he or she gets uh, paid for the work as well. Uh, no, it's volunteering, right? So that's, that's the whole essence of it. We want to make sure that people get the right opportunities to create impact. The moment there is payment involved in it, uh, people do it for money, right? It's much more different than people wanting. And that's exactly why when people volunteer, they only volunteer to nonprofit organizations which don't make money. 
So the idea is uh, there is an NGO which is uh, providing food to the needy, uh, and they need uh, they want to write a proposal to the government that uh, you know this is we are this is an area where there is uh, a lot more poverty. We need to distribute more foods here, but they can only write a proposal in Hindi, whereas it's not relevant uh, to the to the government. Then they have to change the language. So they need help in terms of translating that proposal from Hindi to English. Uh, they can't afford to spend money and pay some professional to do it. This is exactly why Chesuba is valuable, where someone who will do it for free, knowing that that non-profit is not making any money in this whole process. Okay, uh, so I understood of what is the role of non-profit and what is the role of volunteers. You also mentioned a third type of users called corporates. Uh, what is the role of corporates in Chesuba? Uh, well, corporates honestly are the paying users here uh, because we need to, as an organization, we need to get money from somewhere. We can't charge the volunteers, obviously. We can't charge the non-profits. So we charge the corporates, where corporates pay us uh, an, a, a sum of money, mm. where uh, which we provide them a technology platform exclusively for their employees to volunteer and uh, the dashboard access for the corporate to know what kind of impact uh, their uh, employees are creating. This is primarily used for two purposes. One, for corporate CSR role, corporate social responsibility. Mm. that uh, a corporate has uh, a mandate to spend money on the corporate social responsibility sector. Uh, beyond that, it's also the corporate branding for employee engagement. Uh, mm. These days, I mean, millennials are looking for corporates which are more socially and environmentally conscious. So right. the corporate can use this as an opportunity to let their employees know that, okay, you know what, if you're working with us, you also have the opportunity to volunteer online mm. or around that. Right. Uh, 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 Sukhendra, I, I, I have some basic fundamental questions around uh, NGOs and, uh, you know, since you have spent a lot of time in this ecosystem, would like to ask you what is the, uh, what is the purpose or what is the role an NGO serves in a uh, society? Or, an, uh, or in the economy? Quite quite bigger than what we actually anticipate. In fact, uh, recently, the COVID has opened up the whole scenario once again, right? Hmm. Uh, in, in whole COVID scenario, I think the government also tried to ask for funds uh, through the PM cares and all that. So in spite of all that, uh, when it comes to food delivery, it is the nonprofits which NGOs have the skin in the game. They understand this, like we as individuals, I mean, we can go and we say like, okay, I'll cook food and I'll just give to a beggar on the street. But on a scale, it does not work. It needs an institutionalized and an organized process. And NGOs are masters at it because they do it for their bread and butter. They do it day in and day, in and day out. And more importantly, uh, if you take out NGOs out of a society, right, uh, the balance which has to be formed cannot be formed only through a government. What I mean by it is uh, we as a uh, earning individuals, income earning individuals and corporates which are earning profits, mm. ultimately those profits, some of those profits, some of our income has to go back to the society and mm. the government plays a role more so in developing the infrastructure, education system and so on. But with respect to implementation part, okay, they can only set up rules, they can only set up colleges, schools, etc. But in, in, when it comes to implementation of going to those villages and telling their mothers that you have to send your children to school there is no government bodies which do it right or if you're talking about healthcare facilities to go to women and talk about menstrual cycles to talk about hygiene and so on governments don't have bodies to do that ngos play a very active role so whatever is the government trying to do and whatever funds that we as uh, you know tax paying citizens give to hmm. make sure that it reaches the right spectrum of the society NGOs play a very, very active role. And in developing and underdeveloped countries like India and uh, Africa, uh, these NGOs play a much bigger role compared to, let's say, uh, Europe, where things are fairly organized and structured, where NGOs might not be that relevant. Uh, but even there, I mean, if you're talking about environment and so on, uh, there is a lot of awareness that still needs to be brought in. But uh, definitely in countries like India, where we see problems everywhere, NGOs play a very, very active role. I would rate NGOs on par with hospitals in terms of the impact that they create. Uh, how do NGOs operate? Uh, how do they get operational funds uh, to sustain their uh, model? Honestly, a lot of NGOs struggle for funds because uh, fundraising, like in the startup sector, even in the NGO sector, is more relationship driven. 
you know some people in certain corporate and you check with them for funds you know certain people in the government you try to get funds uh, there are 10 million ngos worldwide in india alone there are 3.2 million ngos and maybe 1% of these ngos get funds even less than that so the rest of the ngos usually use their uh, personal funds use their uh, network around it sometimes rich people just set up foundations so that they can give back to the society uh, so usually it's it's driven crowd funded that's that's the most common source of funding that ngos receive the mm-hmm. idea of chesuba is also so that if you are capturing the right data points in terms of which ngo is causing what kind of impact then the match making process and ensuring that most the funds are distributed optimally and equally among ngos so that impact is driven down across all segments because the last thing we want is okay our healthcare is great but education is kind of neglected or education is great uh, and women empowerment is neglected so the idea is if you want to move together forward as holistically as a society then equal distribution need to happen everywhere what covid has done is everyone's like donating to pm cares donating to covid relief activities but tuberculosis a lot people lot of people die with tuberculosis more than covid or a lot of people still do not have access to education now everyone's working from home and so on but government school students they don't have access to study from home so someone still has to take care of that as well you can't just go chasing only covid so sometimes what society does is we are driven by certain enthusiasm either due to our personal biases or due to what's happening in the society the trend uh, and i think chesuba wants to nullify something like that and make sure that there is equal distribution of resources for all the sustainable development goals so that holistically as a community we will probably go forward uh, in a much more sustainable manner hmm. so uh, as you mentioned uh, that only 1% of the ngos get uh, fund uh, and others other ngos they are just Uh, crowd funded or funded by the founders or the uh, you know uh, promoters of the ngo uh, i am talking about the 1% of the ngos which get fund and uh, um, they get uh, primarily from corporates or government bodies how do you make sure that these ngos are acting in the best interest of the society they are uh, using the funds in the right way how do you ensure there are right people to uh ensure that uh, the ngos are you know acting in the best interest of the society so uh, when i say this i also acknowledge the fact that these ngos ngos are uh, big ngos they have been operating from a long period of time uh, so uh, how do you ensure they are working in the best interest of the society is there a framework around that existing framework if not how we can address this uh so ngo sector is an unorganized sector what we mean by that is it's very scattered it's not very systematic the government is trying its best in india at least to organize it as much as possible to eliminate those ngos which are not for example reporting correctly or which have not been active in the last 2 3 years trying to take out their licenses and so on uh but it can't happen overnight and also to measure ground level impact some impact is quantitative some impact is qualitative so mm-hmm. if ngos are only chasing quantitative impact in saying that okay uh, if i spend this 10 lakh rupees in educating 50 students it is like they might just look at okay the 50 students have been sent to school that's mm-hmm. where the impact lies whereas someone might say very qualitative and say that uh, i have hand holded this one child till the university or the post graduation level both are important a quantitative aspect as well as qualitative aspect are both important Hmm. quantitatively we can set up frameworks qualitatively it becomes very difficult because it's very subjective so i don't think there are any frameworks at this point in time but i can't rule out the possibility that frameworks can come into picture in fact that is exactly one of chesuba's mission also to bring the sector into one destination where think of linkedin as a professional network facebook as a social network if chesuba will be the impact network we mm-hmm. can start setting up frameworks based on based on the data that we captured set up certain algorithms and uh, gauge in terms of which ngo is doing what kind of impact we can probably leverage technology to find answers to the questions you have just posed uh, it is only a first step towards it i can't assure you that we will find an answer but this is a start where we have a chance to finding those answers versus not doing anything about it so if I, I, there are three options if i look at it either we believe that ngos will change the world and uh, you know facilitate the process 
either we continue to wait that okay let's see if there is any other better mechanism and let's just wait for that or third we just discard that you know what this does not work let me just do something on my individual capacity the thing is when you do something on your individual capacity as well when you give money to a beggar or something you still can't be very sure whether the beggar is genuine or not whether there's some yeah. mafia around it likewise on the governments as well you can either completely trust the government and say like okay i give money to government you still can't be sure because corruptions everywhere yeah. rooted in the society so i think the power and the finance distribution is very important for a society to go forward and here is where ngos play a very vital role if ngos are not given too much of an incentive if ngos are not given too much funding and they are uh, made to work with those restricted budgets and ensuring that there is an equal distribution of uh, funds across all ngos i think the risk of money being wasted is also diversified which means a better tomorrow for the society so the so to answer your question the framework is not there today but i can't rule out the possibility of the framework coming in the next couple of years or five hmm. speaking of uh, coming days speaking of future i would like to ask you what is the what is your perspective on on the future of ngos or future of uh, uh, social initiatives or non profit initiatives so uh, when i say this i would also uh, bring into perspective that uh, younger generation uh, people who are uh, children were born after 2000s they happen to be more environmentally conscious uh, i think there has been lot of uh, uh, lot of debates around uh, around the world uh, uh, one of the a lady's name the uh, uh greta, greta thunberg so she is also creating a sensation across uh, you know different media and other channels as well the thing is uh, people are getting aware about uh, people are getting conscious and aware about uh, uh, um, need of such entities also they are uh, volunteering Uh, to be a part of uh, such initiatives so uh, having said that how do you see the future of ngos and uh, you know what are the things uh, that we are going to see in coming days well i think technology to start your uh, question to answering your question i think uh, the first step is technology uh, we have to embrace technology whether it's ngos whether it's hospitals whether it's education institutions individuals hmm. uh, we have to accept and embrace technology to move forward for a better tomorrow so i think uh, i've already seen it particularly in ngos so covid has accelerated uh, how the ngos are reacting to technology you know social distancing and everything has made sure that ngos also have to move to zoom calls ngos also have to document their uh, files in google drive and so on so technology is one way how ngos will move forward uh, in the coming days but beyond that the problems that the ngos are trying to solve slowly and steadily are moving over the maslow's hierarchy as you rightly mentioned younger students today are more environmentally conscious because they don't have to worry as much about food as uh, let's say 20 years 30 years ago our parents or we had to worry about uh, poverty was a bigger problem healthcare was a bigger problem so slowly and steadily once these problems are being solved then the new problems which have arisen whether it's environment whether it's gender inequality etc uh people are putting more focus on that so likewise ngos will evolve as well once certain problems are being solved they move to the next problem so okay now i make sure that all students have got basic education so then i move to the next problem which is are students going to pursue what they really wish to or are they just doing whatever like engineering medicine like everyone's doing so there will be maybe 20 years down the line there will be more non profits which are working on individualistic career development on what the student wants versus just providing them with a basic education which seems to be the need of the hour let's say today or 10 years ago but 20 years uh, down the line maybe every student will get basic education the literacy rate will be 100% that uh, there will be no ngos working to get students to school but there'll be ngos uh, trying to uh, make students reach out to their best suited career path on the healthcare as well the same maybe a lot of diseases will have cure so the question will not be about finding cures to these diseases or raising awareness about those diseases but about uh, more healthier lifestyle on uh, making sure people won't get diabetes for example right so more preventive than cure so i see all the non profit or social initiatives will be slowly and steadily moving towards uh, 
a better future as well. The problems that we are trying to solve will be slowly above the Maslow's hierarchy. It won't be on the basic level of ensuring food, shelter, and uh, uh, basic sanitation to people. It will slowly and steadily talk about the purpose of life. And maybe 50 years down the line, there might not be any NGOs because they, I think people have just found the purpose of life that uh, maybe the equality has been restored and maybe there uh, need not be a case of uh, a non-profit trying to solve certain issues. Hmm. Uh, here is an interesting question that I have, Sukendra. Uh, if you uh, look closely, NGOs and uh, corporates or uh, profit-making bodies, these are the uh, two pillars, I would say. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, or rather, I would say, uh, if one pillar is uh, becoming bigger or taking more share, then other is uh, becoming smaller and vice versa also. So. What do you think? Which pillar is growing? Uh, which pillar is diminishing? Uh, and how it will look like uh, in another 10 years time? Uh, well, see, if you go to Europe, the socialistic symbol, uh, which is the non-profit site, is, is growing, right? I mean, it's, it's always uh, there. Uh, the capitalism, you don't find as many super rich people in Europe as compared to, let's say, India or China or, or, or US, which are more capitalistic economies. China may be a little exception there, uh, but India, US, etc. are very capitalistic economies. And likewise, if you move to uh, the Europe where uh, socialistic economies are, are predominant, uh, there there are not so many problems to be solved. So, of course, uh, too much of socialism will, will kill enthusiasm of the human mind and too much of capitalism creates a lot of divide. So there needs to be that nice little balance ensuring that uh, economies move forward. Economies move forward because of capitalism, period. There is no doubt about it, right? People are trying to get richer. People try to do more, learn more, earn more. And that's exactly how the economies thrive. But at the same time, if people are chasing a certain uh, route, which is profits, then it creates that substantial divide between the rich and poor. And here is where nonprofits come into picture or governments come into picture, ensuring there is a slight balance that, that is being striped. So, but at the same time, you can't talk, talk only about balance and, and punish those who, who are uh, trying to get rich, for example. So I think it's, it's that nice little balance which has to be borne on both sides. Nonprofits have to realize that the worth of capitalism is is what it is and likewise capitalists should also uh, acknowledge the fact that some of their profits should go back to the society and ensure that uh, there is progress being done and uh, pillars these uh, the beams which join these pillars are basically the governments the non-profit organizations who are ensuring that there is a nice balance between these two i think they become very very important so the the intent of the governments become important and the genuinity of the nonprofits become important if we are to strike a balance between uh, people getting richer and people getting nicer. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, some of the examples would be Germany or Denmark. Uh, these would be the countries where both the pillars are uh, equally, uh, equally placed and equally growing. Um, so uh, now, uh, I would uh, move to uh, two questions uh, that, that are concerning the personal side of being an entrepreneur. would like to start with asking, when did you think of becoming an entrepreneur? When, when this idea hit your head? You could have uh, gone for a, a full-time job and uh, the pay would have been well. Uh, uh, with the... uh, honestly, I did that. <laughs> We've gone to the full-time job as well. So when, uh, when Isaac happened to me, when I was uh, facilitating volunteering for young students, I really found my passion there. I enjoyed what I did. Uh, it, was, it was taking all of my time and I really, really had no regrets. Uh, absolutely loved it. And when Isaac finished, was finished working full time, as much as I enjoyed working, but it was what people call as a work-life balance, right? It was like, okay, eight hours of work. And then I come home and I would party, I would play some sports, I would have friends, family, etc. It was more of a, two lives that I was living. One is the professional life and one is the personal life. Uh, and when I started to do it for years together, one, two, three years, I just felt like, you know, living these two lives is, is very, you know, it's energy draining. Uh, I have to be my best as professional, I have to be my best as personal. It was, although it was fun to a certain extent and it was quite comfortable life, 
I knew that that was those two lives. I had only one life to live and I didn't have time to do those two lives. So that was when I felt like, how about I find a passion, which is both my work as well as my life. And that's when uh, the entrepreneurship bug bit me. And I was like, uh, I didn't want to do it for money or for freedom. What I wanted to do it was to club my work life balance so that work becomes life, life becomes work. And I can only live one life and be happy about it. Uh, that's when, when I was contemplating in 2017 as to how do I club my work life uh, is when this idea came out, Chesuba happened. And since then, uh, co-founders, we three, we lived in the same house for almost one, one and a half year. So we had that absolutely same work life. We lived in that house. We worked out of that house together, all three of us. Uh, then uh, the team started growing. We couldn't afford to do that. We had to move to our respective houses. But even now, even today, uh, there is no such time as work for us. So, I mean, if need be, if I have to sleep an extra hour, I would sleep an extra hour. Likewise, uh, if I need to have a meeting at one o'clock with a client in the US, I would just wake up at one o'clock with a client in the US because it, I don't have a strict timing as to when I should work. But that's more of a responsibility than a power which is, I, I think I end up working a lot more than what an average employee would do. But I do not feel that way simply because I uh, absolutely love what I'm doing. And I don't know if I'm going to find a job where I'm going to have the same level of respect, love and passion. So I thought like, well, starting your own venture definitely does that because it's your baby and it just comes very naturally, right? You love your baby automatically. So right today is when I feel like uh, my work and life are an absolute balance where I can't differentiate what is work, what is life. And I'm, I'm quite positive about it. Uh, how did you manage uh, the funds or finances when you started this venture? In fact, I'm curious, how, how are you uh, funding the operation uh, event today? So, uh, yes, I mean, uh, from a revenue perspective, of course, as a startup, as a tech startup, uh, it becomes very difficult for us to break even in the early years. Uh, Hopefully, based on the projections, we should be breaking even next year. Uh, but as of uh, when, when we started, uh, we were on zero budgets. Like, I think I had uh, some income tax returns which came through, about 2 lakh rupees or so. That's all, uh, that's all the money I had. So we just took a house. Uh, we worked without salary for almost one year. Uh, we raised money from friends and family. We just get kickstarted that way. Uh, and till today, friends and family have been supporting us, uh, raised more than $200,000 from them. Uh, in fact, uh, we are in the middle of a fundraise now, uh, been receiving quite good interest from VCs. So hopefully we will be able to close down this fundraise by the end of this year and uh, things will start to accelerate. Uh, but honestly, money was the lesser of the problem because you know, when you push yourself, you know, you can just live with one meal a day and and sleep under one roof. That's not, uh, we have got into a comfortable life where we feel that I need this, 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 and this. But truthfully, if you're pushed to a certain level, you can still live that. Uh, so the bigger challenge was us, uh, for us was uh, to keep the focus, to ensure that the passion is not died down, to ensure that these challenges of, you know, your friends going out for cinema every now and then, or they're partying and they keep the social media pictures, they travel. I used to be a huge traveler. So uh, when I know that, okay, I can't do it anymore to keep up with that, that, okay, my life has changed, but it's okay. I love this life as well uh, to acknowledge that and to keep chasing your dream. That is the most difficult part. So first year is very easy because, you know, you kind of feel cool and powerful. Second year onwards, you see the challenges. Third year onwards, you look at other challenges. Now the challenge is not how I get my salary. The challenge is how I ensure my team gets their salary. That's the, so the challenges keep on going. And I think next year we won't have issues with salary. We have issues with how do we make sure the investors get back their money? Maybe seventh year, eighth year, we talk about something else. How do we make sure the business is sustainable and profitable? Uh, and how, how do I scale the team at the same level as it was when 20, 30 people were there? Because then you're talking about management. You're talking about thousand people. It's just not the passion which can drive thousand people. You need to have a very managed and an organized structure. So I think we'll always have the problems. What the first two, three years teach you is acceptance that it's going to be a bumpy ride and uh, be, prepare you for the worst. No, that's, that's just what I can say. Okay. Sukhendra, so uh, speaking of uh, uh, team and uh, paying them salaries, I uh, would like to know uh, most of the NGOs or you know, uh, 
non profit uh, initiatives they hire people uh, who have lesser uh, salary expectations in fact one of the questions they ha- ask during the interview why uh, you j- want to join us with a lesser pay package so uh, i am just curious to know why why ngos hire people with a lesser package uh, because uh, the lesser pay package would also mean that they are not hiring the best minds so uh, whatever i said is it uh, true uh, uh, in the first place uh, if it is true how how do we deal uh, this how do you deal uh, with this situation okay uh, first things first we are not an ngo ourselves we are a for profit tech enterprise hmm. uh, so that that gives us the freedom of that's why we raise money from investors and we uh, charge corporates we attract revenue the idea we have set up a for profit enterprise is exactly what you said where we don't want to have the constraint to not have the best talent because we don't have enough money to pay so the mm-hmm. idea of us having a sustainable or for profit model is also to ensure that at no point in time we will have challenges to scale whether it's from financial perspective or human resource perspective etc uh, coming back to your question yes i think ngos definitely have a challenge and it's not a very conscious effort from them of course they themselves want to get paid highly as well but like i mentioned there are so many ngos and so little funds that are being put into the ecosystem that uh, your answer will eventually when grants are given by the government or by the corporates to ngos they are answerable as to how they are spending this money so if you take 10 lakh rupees as a grant then you have to show certain impact so let's say if i take 10 lakh rupees as a grant and i hire five people who collectively are going to use up 4 lakhs or 5 lakhs as as a salary it just does not make sense for the corporate or the government to give them grants which is why also the bigger ngos are the ones which get grant because if they get a bigger grant the distribution of salary is such that the, still there is impact cost they get a grant of 1 crore maybe 10 lakhs is spent on salary but 90 lakhs is still spent on the beneficiaries uh, on the, for the smaller ngos it's it's very difficult because they can't handle 1 crore rupees funds in terms of operations and if they only get 10 lakhs as a fund 2 3 lakhs 20 30% of it is going in salaries it does not make much sense for the corporate to fund it so non profits don't have much of a choice in terms of how much money they can give because there is less money in the ecosystem but from an employee who is joining a non profit it's not always the case that uh, lesser talent come to come to non profits in fact uh, like harvard those who go to harvard those who go to stanford Uh, about 20 30% of them join non profits in and so the idea for them is that they want to give back to the society and they're also incentivized by these universities uh, let's say if someone does uh, an mba at harvard and if they end up working 3 years post uh, post mba in a non profit their fees is waived off and all so there are certain uh, schemes that are coming to incentivize good talent going to non profits as well uh, but of course i mean it's not still not uh, as good a model as the corporate model is where the best of the talent go to google facebook uber etc it's still not that way in the non profit like there is no comparison between google and the world's best ngo mm. right so it two person will still mo- most probably go to google so they are not on the same level as uh, as corporates yet but hopefully we will see that day where uh, more and more people will start working the better talent will start working with non profits if that is the case then the problems the bigger world problems will also be solved faster and in a more optimized way okay so uh, now would like to ask uh, what is the kind of people you hire in your team what do you see in there well we have very diverse we are in hyderabad office we have 16 people uh, seven women nine men the youngest is 22 the oldest is 56 i guess uh, we have foreigners working in the company we have people who worked uh, in google bank of america in airtel you know the big multinational companies we have people who are ex entrepreneurs we are people who for who this is the first job so it's it's very very diverse uh, in in that sense we have people who studied in iits we have people who studied in colleges i've never heard of so it's it, it is absolutely diverse team that that we have and i think it's important to have diversity in a in an innovative space so that the ideas don't become very monotonous okay yeah uh, diversity part i understood but what is the common thing that all of the, all, all of them have Uh, oh well everybody has taken a cut to join the company everybody is very underpaid in the company which clearly explains that uh, people are passionate about the idea about the 
uh, team together. So when they start, they they have their own reasons, right? Either if it's their first job, they're looking for a career. If people, uh, the person who is 56 years old is looking for, you know, uh, working with a younger team to give back. Uh, the person who worked at Google, she's coming back after maternity leave. So people have their own reasons, but the reasons which keep them in Chesuba today is the family bonding that we have. It's very difficult for uh, some company to take one of my employees. The truth being, we have a very family-like atmosphere here. Although we pay very less, uh, in fact, when COVID came in, we said like, guys, we might not have money to pay. So we asked them, how much uh, money, how much cut can you take? Uh, we just gave them the option and a lot of people took huge cuts to ensure that the organization will sustain. So that kind of atmosphere is what we were able to build as a 15, 20 member team. I don't know if we can build that with a thousand member team. That's exactly why I mentioned that the problems we will have when we have a thousand member team is much different from what we have today. Because motivating the team is not a problem today. In spite of us not paying the best of the salaries, we know the team is together for a cause. Uh, I don't think that will be the case when we have 1,000 people. So the approach will be something different. The problem is something we have to solve at that time. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I think we are almost up with the time. I have uh, three or four questions left. would uh, request you to answer them very shortly. Uh, first, would like to ask, what are the challenges you face along the way while building the venture? As I mentioned, uh, funds are always a challenge for anyone. Uh, but beyond funds, it's also the motivation to keep you going. Uh, personal challenges of ensuring that my, my passion doesn't die down, ensuring that the team has to stick together you know, uh, to keep your morale high. That was always uh, a challenge. But beyond that, it's also identifying the product market fit to have your open ears and eyes all the time so that you understand, you take the feedback and constructively build on it. Uh, to ensure all of these are uh, are the biggest challenges, so product wise, product market wise. Can you give? Some uh, example? I can give you an example, right? With fi funds, I think I don't need to explain anything. But with product market fit, for example, uh, when we started Shizuba, we put it as a one-stop destination to create impact. But we have zeroed down on online volunteering because slowly, it, it's not like we started off as an online volunteering platform we reached out to the market and we learned that online volunteering was more feasible among everything. Likewise, uh, when COVID came through, uh, we realized that there was a lot of corporates which were having interest. So we just built up a corporate SaaS as well to ensure uh, employee volunteering happens. So we are always listening to the market because sometimes uh, you can't show your product into the market, but you have to you know, accept uh, the market as it is and build the product around it. So to be open about it uh, was very important for us. Uh, what is your vision, uh, Sukendra? Well, by 2030, which is 10 years uh, from now, we want to make sure there will be one simple one-stop destination for any person to create impact. What I mean by that is just like LinkedIn is there today for professional networking, Chesuba will be there for impact networking. Uh, and what I mean by that is there will be nonprofits, there will be people who wish to volunteer, there will be people who wish to volunteer to go somewhere and volunteer or volunteer online. There will be people who want to donate, they can just donate. Uh, corporations will be there, uh, so all kinds of corporate uh, partnerships will happen. Government bodies should be there so that uh, the organized and the systematic flow of what's happening with the money being spent and uh, the impact reporting is done in a much more organized fashion. So that's a long-term goal. By 10 years down the line, we want to make sure the non-profit sector or the development sector is organized and on par with the for-profit sector. Okay. Uh, now I would like to know who is your role model when it comes to entrepreneurship? Well, I would say, I mean, I can't pick one, uh, but uh, Steve Jobs is definitely there quite high, uh, you know, because... Uh, one thing that is said, uh, which which stays with me for long, is uh, only those people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. So when we had this idea of Chesuba as well, sounds very huge, right? To change the whole nonprofit sector, it has traditionally been very unorganized, and we are saying like we're trying to organize this. And NGOs are very backward in terms of uh, how their culture is that they are very bureaucratic in that process and relationship driven and not very technology driven. So the challenge was huge for us, but I knew if we somehow tackle this challenge, there is a very high likelihood we could fail. Yes. But even in the slightest of the possibility, if we 
crack the code and if we in fact work out the possibility of organizing the whole sector then i can't imagine the scale of uh, good that happens in the world and uh, how better tomorrow we can create for for the whole universe so i believe i i just like to see that dream of if everything is organized how better the world will be and uh, that will that is ensuring me to to push forward but that is very difficult because you can't see it happening today or tomorrow right it's a long term dream and that's why i think steve jobs is an inspiration because he didn't look at it as uh, yeah i'll create a computer today a colored computer or i create an ipod uh, he didn't stop there he looked at how technology can make a create a better user experience so his dream was not just about creating an iphone or an ipad or an ipod it was much beyond that hmm how do you compare entrepreneurship uh, with a corporate job uh see as long as you're passionate about a corporate job as well if you're extremely passionate then it's not much different it's a job at the end of the day uh but what and the bigger the corporate that you work with the processes are a lot more bureaucratic which means you don't have a lot of power in terms of what you can do so uh, a lot of your ideas will be suppressed killed uh will not see the day of the light so it's uh it's very challenging in that sense but it's also very comforting because you get your paycheck regularly you don't have to worry 9 to 5 or 10 to 6 whatever your time zones are you know just go with that it's it's a free life it's a comfortable life so entrepreneurship is for those as i said who are again crazy enough but it's, it's a it's a very high risk uh, path that people go into uh, with entrepreneurship so uh, no what are the worst that's the best thing like if you know that okay what is the worst that can happen i lose all my money i i'm i'm without a job for 3 years so look at all the worst case possibilities and if the idea or your passion still drives you to chase it then go for a startup or go for an entrepreneurship else uh, job is quite comfortable i mean those uh, if, if you look at the worst case scenario and you say like oh i'm not very sure because i think nobody can tell you to be an entrepreneur you either figure it out yourself or uh, all people can tell you is the worst that can happen the best that can happen and all uh, which are also speculations uh, but you can just say that and uh, uh, if you have any doubt then i think you should just join a company uh, because uh, once you join to be an entrepreneur you'll create more and more doubts so you just can't move forward with it so any doubts if if the question is being asked the answer is clear uh, go for a company if the question is not being asked then again the answer is clear anyway you're going for a startup Mm. Now here is my last question Sukendra how do you suggest our audience to start their journey as entrepreneurs where do they start well, as i mentioned just right right away uh, ask yourself the question it is not about the problem that you are solving the solution that that brings to the table the market size all that are are secondary uh, if the question is about whether you wish to be an entrepreneur or not then you ask yourself what you wish to do in your life what is it that you want what are the things that you can compromise or sacrifice and what are the things that you would like to chase is it a small dream versus a big dream um you know is it about what is your is your dream buying a house uh, building a house buying a car or is your dream something much bigger uh, because uh, once you have yourself clear in your mind what is it that i want based on that you can choose what what you really wish to go so if if all your answers are yes i have a very big dream i really want to i don't know rule the world i really want to uh, be one of the richest people in the world i really uh, you know want to create something that is going to create a magnificent uh, impact in in the universe uh, then your answers are clear uh, then you go for it uh, if that's what you want to do then start finding the problem if you if you are absolutely sure that you want to be an entrepreneur then look for a problem and most entrepreneurs don't solve the problem that they first thought was there you pivot you pivot you pivot and and you eventually come to a problem which is suitable for the market so uh, don't start with the problem start with yourself and then figure out a problem figure out a solution around it and everything will fall into place as long as you are very clear in terms of what you're doing so spend 80% of the time on knowing yourself whether you really wish to take this path or not and not on the idea and the data points excel sheets and all that that's really not important what's really important is uh, your confirmation whether you really wish to do it or not 
Uh, well, on that note, I'll uh, close this session and I would like to thank you for taking our time and joining this session. It was a great pleasure to host you here at ELI. I think our audience would have got uh, lifetime lessons from this video, Sukendra. Thanks for your time and our best wishes. Thanks, Priya. Or, uh, Sejuba. Yeah, thank you so much. It was my pleasure uh, to add some value and hopefully uh, we will see more entrepreneurs coming uh, through, this, through this session. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. You too. Viewers, you can follow and connect with Sukendra on LinkedIn by searching for Sukendra Reddy Gromapalli. Also, do visit their website uh, by typing sejuba.net and do volunteer. So, whom do you want to have here at ELI for next episode? Do let me know in comments below. We'll be back before you know it. Stay tuned to ELI.